Thank you, Your Royal Highness. You highlighted very, very important points. The role of tradition in conservation. You've highlighted the role of women, that it's important to empower women to be able to address climate change issues, climate change adaptation, mitigation. You've talked about the African spirit of togetherness, the Ubuntu spirit that we have, and that's the spirit that we all need to bring together and be able to support the restoration agenda. Nananum, I'm just looking forward to the day that when somebody gives birth, we don't go with diapers, so we go with the plant to plant trees. I'm looking forward to the day that when you're being married off, you know, I know it's done in Uganda, you know, you bring trees to plant. And when somebody passes away, we also plant to relieve their dreams. And I think that's one way or several ways of really promoting the restoration agenda in terms of institutionalizing our values, our culture, our beliefs. So once again, thank you very much. And we look forward to connecting with you all, traditional and cultural leaders here, in moving this agenda forward. In a very short moment, uh, we would be having a panel discussion. I'll keep it short and sweet in the interest of time, because I know that it's been a long day. Um, so I want to welcome already uh, um, the panelists. Uh, the grounds have been laid for us to share with us some reflections and perspectives on the restoration agenda. Let me welcome Mamadou Yakite from NEPAD and AF AFRI 100, Senior Manager for Sustainable Land Management. Mamadou, if you're here, please come on the podium. Let me welcome Stuart Maginis, Global Director, Nature Based Solutions Group, IUCN, please. Bernard Worm, Senior Policy Advisor, Officer at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BM BMZ. Bernard? And a wonderful lady, Mutsamai Mambato, Managing Director, Afrolutionist, and AFR 100 Youth Ambassador. Please don't leave because we have all the excellences here and they would have to leave before we leave. So please, we will keep it rather short and sweet. Do we have a microphone there? Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? All right. So we have a very distinguished uh, panel here to share with us some reflections on the restoration agenda. Again, uh, what we're going to do is that I'm going to take a first round of reflections. Uh, depending on time, we might dig deeper into some of them. Uh, and perhaps so that it doesn't become a monologue, take one, um, take one or two questions. Okay. All right. All right. I do understand that uh, Madam Chief of Staff would have to leave. Uh, at some point. So I want to say thank you very much again for coming. Please let's recognize her as uh, she goes back to deal with the uh, issues of state, uh, very important issues. And to thank her once again, Mama Yadasi. Let me show Yadasi. So let me start off with the Mamadou. I mean, you coming from Nepal, you carrying the continental vision uh, and dream of a new Africa that also supports the restoration agenda. Where do we stand in Africa? How do you see things? I mean, where are we? What are the opportunities? Uh, where are the challenges? Particularly coming from the meetings on the AFR uh, 100, what would you want to tell us? Okay. Keep Thank it short and sweet. Very short. Thank you for the opportunity. opportunity. Thank you, GLF. And uh, since two years now, we are having a meeting back to back with GLF and AFR 100. And I am here sitting today uh, representing um, the Dr. Ab uh, Ibrahim Hassan Mayaki, the CEO of the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, as well as the countries and all the partners of uh, AFR 100. 
we, we just had two, two days of, uh, of meeting. We just start, uh, finished in, um, at noon today. And uh, very lively debate, very, very, very interesting. And uh, we can say that the, the momentum of uh, African countries' commitment is still very high. And um, we got a mandate from 2015 from the African Union to work on this initiative to restore 100 million hectares of land uh, by 2030. It's a huge, huge um, challenge. But when you see the energy that we had in this uh, room, we can, we can make it. And in addition to countries, so far 20 can, 28 countries have joined and we are waiting more uh, to come, especially from West Africa where we were in Dakar a few days ago. We are waiting for more commitments. Along to, to those commitments, we have also countries. This is another message that we want to share. African countries are, are putting resources, money into restoration. So if you, you are told that uh, uh, we are waiting for only external money, this is not the case. We are putting money into and, and people, uh, resources to restore land because now we see the benefits, the economic benefits, financial, and um, for, for young people, for women to, to do restoration. It is not only to plant trees and fence them, but it's to, to, to do uh, planting for subsistence and for, uh, for business and, um, and, 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 and so on. And also, we are receiving a lot of support from international partners. We can mention um, uh, Germany, we can mention um, uh, the Minister of Environment of Germany of, um, uh, and the Minister of Economic Cooperation, which, who are very, very supportive. And uh, we are about to launch, as just one example, uh, uh, 23 million uh, euros uh, program for restoration in four African countries, Malawi, Kenya, Cameroon, and Rwanda. And we, we, we are really uh, optimistic that there will be more uh, of all the, this type of initiative to, to come. And also, there is a, a, a huge part of communication advocacy to disseminate the, the information. So we have a very strong communication uh, component to, to it. But to attract in, uh, investment, to gain credibility in, in terms of restoration, we need to monitor what, what is being restored. So we have also a strong work on uh, um, uh, monitoring, tracking progress of, uh, of restoration in, uh, in Africa. And uh, we really hope that this, and we are faithful that this will continue and by um, in, in a year time, we will uh, be able to, to, to show more progress. So, Mamadou, it looks like everything is going perfectly well from what you're saying. And I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, Stuart, you are listening in, and he says everything is rosy. We are making very good progress. We are getting lots of money. Where do we stand in all these things? I mean, is the bond challenge moving forward? I mean, what is your assessment? Is it consistent with what Mamadou is saying? Yeah, very much so. Uh, I think, uh, actually, we uh, one hears from time to time that, Forest landscape restoration is a beautiful thing, beautiful idea, but is it really scalable? Can it really go to scale? Well, I would actually say there is very strong evidence that it is going to scale. IUCN's uh, done a, well, maybe first of all, I should say there's already globally 175 million hectares pledged from 61 countries now. That's Rwanda, an African country, was the first country to begin that, those pledges in 2011. And as Mamoudou said, last week we had Gambia and Senegal uh, uh, pledge uh, commitments. But it's much more than pledging. IUCN has actually been looking at uh, working with governments on, on uh, self-reporting to track progress, both on whether if the enabling conditions are in place, is uh, action happening on the ground, and what actually are those impacts. And the interesting thing is we can now say that of, of the, uh, the, the, the countries we've worked with, we've got something like 58% of those pledges have been translated into action on the ground. They've actually been translated into trees and agroforestry and work. Um, the other thing is, I think another really interesting fact, is that we talk about mobilizing resources, but from the work we've done, we can see that 80% of the payment of those efforts are coming from domestic sources.
countries realize this is important so they're reallocating resources to actually support restoration and then in terms of impact we're actually seeing um, we're seeing significant amounts of carbon sequestered we're, and we're seeing uh, new jobs created at the minute of, the, uh, of those, uh, those countries that we've worked with 350,000 jobs have been uh, new jobs have been created in Rwanda where we actually had some gender, gender differentiated sampling we could see that that was split half half so I think actually we have now got real examples that forest landscape restoration can go to scale the, the challenge now is how we sustain it and how we actually expand that. All right, no, thank you very much, Stuart. I mean, talking about scalability and sustainability. And uh, you were listening in, Bernard, uh, from the development partner's point of view. Yes. And, uh, you know, African Nepal says everything is going well. We're doing very well. IUCN said we're making good progress, uh, and we can track that. Uh, but what do you see as the needs? And uh, what can be done differently? Where are the needs? I mean, I'm sure you get requests coming yeah, in sure. several times. Yeah. So Thank we can balance the conversation a bit more. Yeah. Thank you, Elsie. Um, sure, when we talk about the needs uh, uh, in the field of uh, forest and landscape restoration, first of all, um, I think it is important to incorporate the policies of the national government, gov governments. Yeah. So these, uh, these policies have to be adjusted to um, the needs of uh, forest and landscape restoration and um, in order to combine economic development and the conservation of natural resources. Um, without that, um, sustainable uh, landscape restoration won't be, won't be possible. Another point is uh, to foster policy coherence across sectoral boundaries. The restoration and management of Africa's landscapes can only be successful if all relevant sectors are considered. So, for example, when we talk about the landscape, it would be um, forests, of course, it would be water, it would be energy or agriculture. So, to think more holistically or integrated in a kind of a, also, if you want, a sort of a territorial perspective and getting out of these silos. Another point is, um, which is getting more and more important and uh, is to consider this demographic change. Yeah. We know that the population growth will have a significant impact on the, yeah, on, or will have a significant pressure on uh, landscapes, on forests and agriculture. And these have to be taken into uh, consideration by national governments and integrated into the policies as well. And then, of course, use innovative partnerships and corporations uh, at landscape level to strengthen local ownership. Also, that's what we just heard, and that's why I think this, uh, the, the uh, statement of the Queen were, were very suitable. Um, even though the government is key uh, for shaping the policy framework for restoring Africa's land landscapes, um, local com communities, rural populations, uh, the expertise of uh, the, the, the people living in the landscape has to be definitely integrated um, and considered to, yeah, to be successful. Uh, the conversation is still going on. Uh, we have NEPAD uh, telling us about the good progress that African countries are making, uh, the commitments that are coming, and uh, of course we have IUCN building on the case, talking about the need for us to go at scale, but also sustain the gains that we have. And from the development partner's point of view, the need for us to integrate restoration to national planning processes. Uh, so the key issue around integration mainstreaming has uh, come out very clear. But now you're sitting there listening to all these people. Uh, Motsamai. Motsamai. Okay. Mabato. Okay, let me see. Mabato. You're listening and you're saying, hmm. Okay. Now, from where you sit as an ambassador, as a youth, how does this whole thing play? Well, how do you see the work and the role of the youth or other actors? Particularly, you've been listening to the Nabakereka, the cultural leaders, traditional leaders. How do you see that role, particularly from a youth's point of view? Thank you. Um, before we look into uh, the youth and uh, cultural and other players, non-state actors as people who can uh, inform land restoration, I think we need to tap into why they're excluded in the first place. And for the most part, when you look at the nature of how um, 
consultations happen and the implementation strategy as well as decision making, it's a hierarchical approach, right? It's top bottom. It's uniting action from above and below. It's not uniting action with the lateral stakeholders in mind. And I think that's the core of it. We have centralized uh, the way in which we implement our development. We have centralized our knowledge. We have centralized our power and, our, our, and granting access to power. And that's the core reason why um, in one reality you would assume that you're making progress. And for a lot of actors who are on the grasslands, they don't see uh, these things that we talk about in the reports. They're not necessarily so, super reflective. And it's because you, in, in the first place we have, we've done uh, centric work for at least the past 300 years. I come from Botswana which is a country where uh, it's now re um, receiving a lot of global attention on the fact that uh, human, the first modern civilizations of 130 years ago were existing in Makhadi Khadi Pans, which used to be Makhadi Khadi Salt Lakes. And the main reason of their migration was based on climate change. So for us, climate change has been an issue for 130,000 years. Thank you for joining in on the conversation, but uh, for the most part, when we look at how when you look at how we, uh, <laughs> <thank you. laughs> when you look at how we mitigate climate change, it comes. It should always come from the ground up, and it should always be lateral, uh, decentralized knowledge and act uh, and 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 nature of stakeholder engagement. It doesn't make any sense for an, an international organization to start thinking of uh, grassroots movements as an afterthought after they've had their multiple consultations and multiple gatherings of, the, of, this, of this very kind. It makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Thank you. It, it, it makes looking at um, the rate in which the earth is becoming more and more dangerous for us to, to live as human beings, it makes a lot more sense for us to work on a lateral level, for cultural leaders and young people and women, especially rural women, to be engaged at the beginning. When you, when you identify a country that is going through uh, deforestation or desertification, you just, I mean, it's easy, you just talk to the people and you hear the solutions that come from there. We have knowledge of history of 70,000 years. It could have easily been included in some of the uh, ratifications made in the Paris Agreement. Barumbukushu, Baye, Yibasara people, they exist, they have long been there before uh, a lot of this industrialization. We can mitigate um, uh, land, uh, land uh, deforestation and other forms of afforestation in our, in our continent. I just think it's, uh, we just need to be more open-minded and change our lenses from the core in order to move forward. Thank you. No, I mean, you, you've, hit, uh, you've hit the right point on the need for stakeholder engagement uh, to talk to the right people. Uh, and really, let's get out of this centralized approach. Uh, I, and I, I will come back to the panelists later on because I don't think you're going to the crux of the issue. Everything seems to be okay. Uh, but uh, by 2030, I mean, we are far away from this restoration. I know we're making good progress and we want to see the glass half full, but we also do have some challenges. And I, I think at this stage, I would allow one or two people from the audience to share some reflections of where they sit, how they see things. And then I'll come back to the panel for some more, uh, because we don't want to leave here just say everything is fine. I mean, where are the issues we have to address? And I don't think you've hit on those issues as of yet. Who is inspired? All right, I'll take one gentleman here. Somebody has a microphone to give? Let's be quick. A contribution to the conversation or even a different perspective? Short and sweet. Okay. Thank you very much. Once again, I'm Leo Tuinomwanji from Uganda. Restoration of landscapes should now focus on restoring people because you cannot restore landscapes unless you yourself are restored. So, like the Queen indicated, people must be restored if they are to restore the landscapes. Restored? We have for some time focused 
and neglected the values of the people. In the morning we said, the family is key. And secondly, the community. And now this family for some time has been lost. Our actions are because people are no longer being brought up with the right values. And so they have negative actions towards nature. Degradation has come, and that's why we are talking about restoration. You restore what has been degraded. And it is, it is us, it is me, it is you, it is man who has destroyed it. Now, we want to restore the landscape. And who is going to restore it? It is man. And what we are saying now, the focus, the inspiration is that man should be restored first. You must change. You, are mu you must change if you want to restore. You cannot restore nature if you yourself. I think you get the point. It starts with you. Very, very profound. Uh, we cannot be restoring landscapes if we ourselves are not restored. And restoring ourselves means going back to our values and our beliefs and our traditions. Okay. I'll take one more. And I hope there's a lady there. There has to be some gender balance here. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll take you then. I'll close it because okay. I know we're running late. Okay. And uh, yes, okay. please go ahead. Yeah. I, my name is... Stephen Lowry, and I just want to echo my friend from uh, Uganda, is it? Uganda. And, and I like to talk about restoring forests, restoring communities. I agree completely with the gentleman. We can't think of forest restoration as something about, apart from giving people the power and the rights, restoring their rights to their land to take command of their resources in ways that result in sustainable outcomes. So we have to really think of human restoration. We have to see it as a humanistic enterprise. Restoring forests has got to be seen as a humanistic enterprise. So I really thank you, sir, because I, I agree very much with your sentiments. I'll take the lady over there, and uh, if I may also maybe humbly ask maybe one of the Nananum if they have some perspectives as well on how we can restore the human being from a traditional point of view. That would be interesting to hear. Thank you very much. I wanted just even to echo more to say restoring, yes, but we need to conserve what we have still healthy and mobilizing resources to restore, yes, but we need to stop, stop those investments that are degraded land, that are degraded land. So I think it's really important to also have a look at that disenabling environment that is still there and that is destroying the land and the people and the nature. So we need to have a lot of work and support, and with friends that are supporting restoration, continue also to bring the message to stop the perverse investments and the degrading investments. Thank you very much. A very important point in there. Uh, we can't just do any investments. It has to be environmentally friendly. So money can be coming in, but it's destroying your lives, it's destroying the community, it's destroying the country, and we have to be very careful and savvy on what investments uh, we do for our countries. All right. Um, I, okay. I think Nana wants to say something. Uh, yes. Um, Nana Adumensa Asari, representing His Royal Majesty Otunfo Seki II, who has, as a person, and as a traditional leader, has taken it upon himself to at least make sure that all the degraded lands in his jurisdiction are restored. That is why 
Today he's in South Africa. He has asked two chiefs and three gentlemen, sorry, four gentlemen, including his personal chief of staff, to be present at this forum. And what we have realized is that, as he said at the UN General Assembly, it seems that the traditional authority is being taken away. Because you are there as a chief. And before you realize, a concession is given to somebody to come and mine, come and do um, cut timber. I mean, do all these things to degrade the land. And you are there, you can speak. I think it's time that the authority of the traditional leaders are restored. And we have resolved to take it back. If I, what we're doing in Ashanti region, we don't want to involve any political or governmental organization. So that if one political uh, authority stem ends, and you don't have access to the other one, you don't have any opportunity to continue with your reign. So what we're doing is that we're touching base with the people. From our perspective, we tried, when he made me the chairman and then asked me to work with the secretariat, we tried to move to each community, identify their needs. So like my brother from Uganda and then collaborated by my brother here also said, we need to empower the people. We need to restore the people. You come to my community, the people are so impoverished. If I get up, I don't know what to, do, what to eat. How do you tell me to go and restore land? So what we're trying to do is that at least try to meet the, some of the needs, if not all of them. As we speak now, we've engaged about 450. Our intention is to engage about 600. Because if it is tree planting, I go to the community, plant the tree from, say, uh, from this conference. Uh, somebody suggested that uh, after every conference, we try to plant some trees. He said he has three trees in um, Uganda or Kenya. In Kenya. Who is there to nurture the trees? But if it is in the hands of the people, so that is what we are trying to do. Give them the resources. Motivate them to go to the land. Work on it. Make sure they are giving the, the necessary um, guidelines. Or, yes, the guidelines. So that they, if they understand what they are doing, and if they are also fed, uh, some of their health needs, education needs are met. It's likely we can succeed. So we just don't go, go and sit down, talk to them, or go and plant trees, uh, restore the land, and then go back. They need to res uh, resource them, and then to motivate them, we'll make it work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nana. I think this has been very exciting and, and profound. We have moved from just restoring landscapes to restoring people to restoring the authority of traditional leadership. I mean, this is, uh, this is amazing. And of course, uh, thank you for the point that you raised that you can't just say restoration, go and plant trees. We need to go back to the core of poverty eradication. If the person is poor, they have to cut the tree, they have to eat, they have to make their fufu, you know? So let's get back to the core, let's find alternative livelihoods. Uh, but let's empower the people, let's go back to the people. All right, so you are listening now, I think you're getting the pulse from the audience, and uh, I want to come back to you, panelists. I would come back to you again. Uh, with some final reflection, because I want to close this. It's almost uh, late now. Uh, Mamadou, you're listening. Uh, I think the region is moving fast. We still have the you know, agenda 2063. What do you think we should do differently? For us to get to that tipping point as Africa, where we can say we have really restored. I mean, we've been having these conversations year and year again. What do we need to do differently? I think that the solutions were given in front of us, right in front of us. And um, I can mention an example of one um, 
local leader who was here also from Nigeria, from the northern part. And I will give that just that example that can be, I think it can mirror from the, um, the traditional leader here. What he did, observing that his constituency was a lot of poverty and a lot of land. And uh, what he did was to go to the federal government of Nigeria, agree to get some land to be dedicated to, to those poor people in his community, and then 300 hectares, divide them into one hectare per family, manage to get them property rights, land tenure, we are talking land tenure, and then they sit in a participatory manner to agree on what to plant. So consultations, not imposing anything to the population. They take the ownership. And from there, they agree to which plant, which tree to, 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 to use. And after two years, the land is restored. They have uh, uh, food for their uh, families and they can even sell to the market. And so you, you restore the traditional leader, you restore the, the man, you restore the family, and you restore dignity for these people. So there was uh, 2,000 household. Keep, keep it short. 2,000 household. They manage now, they are employing in total 6,000 people are benefiting from that. Multiply this by 1,001 million in Africa, and you solve the restoration, the land, the, 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 the migration, forced migration, and uh, you, you, you lift the economy and the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mamadou. I mean, this is very core to also the, the work of the Sustainable Development Goals, leaving no one behind and reaching the fathers behind first. In other words, you're looking at the poor and trying to empower them. Now, uh, uh, Stuart, you're, you're listening in. I don't want you to talk about IHCN. I want you to talk about a coordinated approach from development partners to help this restoration agenda. Because sometimes we also go different ways and we start pulling the governments and the countries and the community different ways. How can we do things differently from a collaboration point of view? The, um, I, I think actually where the things start are at the, at the country level. I, I've, I've never... I've, always believe that it's the development partners need to, as a group need to respond to they need to be demand responsive to um, uh, the, the needs and requests at both the national and subnational level um, it is uh, I, I think the development partners need to listen and be adaptable they need to be able to um, ident to understand that restoration will take place in different forms and shapes according to those needs, that there's not one particular blueprint. And I actually think that's part of the reason why we've seen such, more, such progress on the forest landscape restoration is because there hasn't been a single type of restoration pushed. There's been a wide breadth of restoration. So I, I would say actually the, uh, what we need to do is we need to keep responding and listening to what's required at national level. A lot of the stuff has been actually said here already. And I think what the development partners need to do is to make sure that they, they hold back, they don't try to over-regulate, over-plan, over-manage from a top-down perspective, but, other, but really be there to respond and help support capacity and, and, uh, and uh, delivery. Thank you very much. So, Bernard, what are you, any final thoughts from you? I mean, we have uh, 11 years to 2030. What do you want to see, looking back in 2030? Uh, looking back uh, from 2030 to, uh, to the past uh, decade, I think it is, um, I think this, what, what we learn here in this, in this Global Landscapes Forum here in Ghana, in the previous one, what we are learning through the AFR 100 annual partnership meetings, there is such a huge variety of experiences of um, success stories of, uh, of, uh, like of, of opinions and views, I think it would be absolutely relevant to, to make finally use out of all that, yeah, and not, not continuing the way doing business as we are doing it 
so far. Yeah, so there is there is knowledge from the landscape level from uh, local communities. This has to be integrated into yeah finally into policies and uh, and uh, be implemented. And I think this global landscapes forum uh, offers a very uh, good uh, um, opportunity for that. Well, thank you very much. Please, a round of applause for Bernard. It has to be business unusual. Literally, that's what you're saying. Uh, we have to do things differently. And you've come back to the core message that you, it has to be integrated into the national policy, national planning, national budgetary frameworks to be able to make sure that whatever we are doing are sustainable. Mbato, I was inspired when you spoke. And the world is looking at you now. Any final reflections from you, from where you sit, and how we can advance this course in a very tangible way? Mm. Um, tangibly speaking, we should be uh, appreciative and grant visibility towards the many kinds of societies that exist in our world. Um, some of the, of course, the, the most visible one would be the capitalistic uh, society, the economies that are based on extractivism. Um, but we are losing sight of so many societies that existed before that of capitalism. And I think that in moving forward towards a restoration of land, um, particularly towards my, the areas of my concern, which is Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Angola in southern Africa. We should, one, respect tradition, deeply respect tradition, and respect the tribes and the cultures that are deeply averse to capitalistic systems and that are still living, um, the world will know them as indigenous persons, but they're still living in the societies that are outside of the margins of capitalism, um, but not only just to respect uh, their way of living, but to also appreciate that there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge that can be granted into how we can mitigate um, climate change and climate-based issues such as the restoration in itself. And for the most part, we need to completely change our lens of how we do work. I am so grateful that the previous speaker spoke of um, how they need to relinquish uh, development agencies must rather things start from a country level and they relinquish um, this paternalistic approach of uh, programming. Uh, we can't, Africa is the, it's a really big continent. It's the biggest continent in the world. And in terms of land restoration, from country to country and even within countries, um, the solutions can, can apply differently. So the only, the most practical way to do that is to allow uh, grassroots organizations and uh, people in, living in rural areas um, grant them the same autonomy that they have granted themselves, the agency that they have already within themselves to perform a forestation, uh, um, restoration action within their societies. And then it will speak into the larger, the larger um, numbers that we want to have met in terms of the amount of million hectares that we want to restore on the continent. Thank you. So, a round of applause again for the panelists. And of course for me as well. <laughs> I'm joking. Now let me try and summarize a key point that are coming out of these discussions. I think uh, clearly we've heard that there's a need for strong leadership from the countries to address these issues of restoration. Nobody's going to do it for you. You have to do it yourself. We've also heard that we have to find local solutions to our problems. Okay, so let's go back to the roots, let's talk to the communities, let's empower them. We've also heard that, you know, we can parachute solutions from external sources. It has to be country-owned, country country-led. Country and also, time and again, we've heard today the role of traditional and cultural leaders. And I think as a UN family, Musundam, looking at you, we need to do more than we are doing. In fact, uh, we're just about scratching the surface and we have to go deeply. Uh, and do things differently. Uh, and that role has come up very strongly, and I'm hoping that uh, from this meeting, we will try to start working very more consistently and strategically with our cultural and traditional leaders in moving the restoration agenda forward. So on my side, please. <laughs> on my side, it's been a great pleasure having you here, and uh, I'm glad uh, we can continue the conversations. It's just not going to be a, a one-off. And I will now hand over to the GLF Secretariat to take us through the rest of the evening. But stay put, uh, we have to let the traditional leaders leave first before we all do. So once again, thank you very much for listening in and a round of applause for yourselves.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Elsie, and our lovely speakers. This was an incredible discussion, um, and the audience for contributing such valuable insights. Um, it's definitely reassuring that there's political backing, there's support from our cultural and young leaders as well. So I want to provide a little bit of insight into next steps for the evening. Um, and there are two sessions which are going to happen right now. The first is a session on enhancing natural resource governance in Ghana, happening in Committee Hall 1 with hosts IUCN Ghana, Arocha Ghana, and SNV Ghana. Um, and they will be sharing their experiences, particularly on the community natural resource management areas, CREMA. But if you wish to get a different insight into Ghana and CREMA projects through the eyes of youth, we invite you to the second session, which is happening in the Asase Fest. So this weekend, we took 30 young people um, to local communities um, into two different places in Ghana on the coast. Um, and they will be sharing their videos, their pictures, their insights into that experience. And that is happening now as well. Um, and then lastly, this evening at around 7 p.m., we have an incredible concert planned in the outside garden with three different Ghanaian local artists featuring primarily Rocky Dooney. Um, so we welcome you to join for that. And my final announcement is um, a photographer has lost um, a telephoto lens. So if you do find anything, I think there are a few phones who have been lost as well, please do share that with the registration desk. Thank you so much. And at this point, we would like to invite our cultural leaders um, to depart. Thank you so much. Can everyone give them a round of applause and stand, please?